Good evening and welcome to the regularly scheduled June 26, 2017 Midland Public Schools Board of Education meeting. At this time, if everyone could turn off their cell phones so that we don't have interference with our television feed, I would appreciate it. And at this time, if everyone would rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, President Branstad. Here. Vice President Singer. Here. Treasurer Frizee. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Friedel. Here. All present. Excellent, thank you very much. Moving into item two, which is our consent agenda. 2.1, approval of the regular meeting minutes from June 12th, 2017. 2.2, .2, following person is recommended for employment, Janet Greif. 2.3, following staff members have announced their resignation effective on dates noted. 2.4, is approval of the payment of the school systems bills for the month of May, 2017 as listed in the check registers prepared by Ms. Holderby, um, in the total amount of $6,494,324. All right, at this time, do I have any additions to the consent agenda or pullouts? Yes, I would like to pull out 2.2 uh, for Ms. Janet Wright and put that into our action item, because we just have a couple little uh, comments and um, and so I don't know if we want to put that as at the end of the three. We'll, we'll do three point six. Okay, three six. So I'll move two point two and make it three point six. All right. So at this time, then I'm looking for a motion to approve items two point one, two point three, and two point four. I move to uh, approve items two point one, two point three, and two point four. Support. All right, moved by Cam, support by Mary. Is there any discussion on these three? All right, seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, consent agenda passes. Moving into three, um, presentations to the board for action. First thing will be the 2016-17 final budget amendment. Turn it over to you. Thank you. And ready here? I uh, just want to refresh your uh, memory as to where we're going to go here with uh, tonight's action. Um, uh, we've had a timeline, which we started back in April with our budget workshop. Uh, we did our proposed 17-18 budget back on June 12th with the public hearing uh, we haven't received any public input on that, nor did we at the meeting. And tonight, you're first going to approve the final uh, amendment, if you will, of the 2016-17 budget, and you'll also be doing the adoption of the 17-18 budget. Um, this is the 16-17, and what I tried to do was give you a uh, snapshot across of uh, how we started uh, the original budget back in June of 2016. That was our estimate. Remember, we always set that budget before we have the audit. So what you're looking at there is uh, original. And then, of course, in March was the uh, first amendment that uh, typically the mid adjustment that you approved. So that was March. And now you're looking ahead in red there at the end of uh, where we stand uh, here in June with our estimate. Because again, once the audit comes in, that could vary slightly, as you know. Where we're making predictions as we go. Um, you'll see that the uh, budgeted revenues are up slightly, uh, just as the expenditures are slightly down on that. Um, at the same time, you might say, wow, the excessive revenues look like they went up there. But just remember what you're starting to see at this point in time is actually that variance I talked about. If you remember, we try to be pretty conservative when we say the variance is going to be 1%. It's typically higher than that. And what we do on the final adjustment is we ask everybody out there, what haven't you spent? What are you sure you're not going to spend? Uh, sounds kind of weird, but we kind of say, give that back to us so we know you're not spending it. 
And so you'll start to see some of that variance appear. So the roughly 700,000 is there. That's like another percent of the variance that shows up in the excess revenue because they haven't spent that. Um, the actual changes between revenue and expenditures between March and June really amount to a half percent or less when you put them in context of how much revenue and how much budget we have taken in. And that's the kind of little adjustments you get. Um, if you remember last time, for example, on revenues, we talked about the IDA flow through money coming from um, the ESA. It's things like that, little revenue changes. And expenditures the same way. It can be at this point, you know, we finally, when we do the initial budget, we have to estimate because uh, last year we had 50 employees we we're going to hire. So medical costs can either come in a slightly higher or slightly lower depending on were they family programs, were they single, single plus one. And so this is about the time that we adjust some of those. We still expect to have a budget variance. So you'll see a 1% amount still there. Um, so the, the good news there is that uh, you'll be putting the um, uh, 2.6 million basically back into your fund balance. Again, remember I'm showing you the unrestricted fund balance because I want you to, fund balance is one thing. If I showed you that, you'd be at about 15.7. But out of that fund balance, there is amounts that either have been donated in the, in the form of this is going to the STEM programs, or they could be things like a prepaid inventory, things that we had to buy a little bit ahead that are sitting there. So there's various things that come out when it's unrestricted. And so you'll see we're, we're going to end the year around 14.2. True numbers will come in um, with the audit, but that's our best estimate at this point in time. And you have to realize we're still working with purchase orders coming in today and through the end of this week. So it goes right up to June 30th, so like always. So that's where we stand on the 16, 17, and you would need to uh, vote to, to make that amendment and adopt the amended budget. So at this time, I will take a motion to approve the 2016-17 final budget amendment. So moved. All right. Support. Moved by Scott. Support by Pam. At this time, I will open it up for any discussion. The numbers look great. We're moving in the right direction. Revenues are higher than expected. Expenditures are lower than expected. We've got a, a healthy fund balance, and we're moving for even... Uh, <coughs> our goal of a uh, healthier fund balance. So um, I'm very pleased with this. It was exciting when we uh, heard about the IDEA flow through fund, getting those back to our school. So um, I'm quite pleased with this budget. Is there any more discussion? Thanks, Bob. Welcome. Takes a lot of work, as you know. I think I said last time, I never want to take credit for it because it's a lot of people doing a lot more work than I am. Um, that, uh, that deserve credit. Uh, Lori, who's sitting back here, of course, and all the buildings give us back that information. I mean, um, they do listen to us when we say, you know, you can spend it, but are you really sure? It's, it's, <laughs> they all help. So thanks to everybody. Yes. Yeah. All right. At this time, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Okay, then I'm going to have Cindy change to the next Same. slide there. Moving into 3.2, which is approval of our 2017-18 general operating And I'll, like I have said earlier, and I'll turn this over to Mike, but the numbers that I had in the last budget, that's just a recap of them for you again from what was presented on June 12th with the revenues, uh, expenditures, uh, our variance, et cetera there, and, and again, the unrestricted fund balance. And I'll say again that we usually uh, err on the side of being cautious on the variance because don't want to be in a situation where the variance goes the other way on you and, and catch you by surprise. But I'll turn it over to Mike. So uh, revenue, Gary, Gary Glenn sitting out there. So I'll say thank you, Lansing, again. They get their budget done. Um, there's been years we've been in October or November, um, and so we're estimating numbers. This time it's not an estimate, although I do have to still hold back that sometimes we get surprises when we get to school aid check still a categorical or something where we actually, lately it's been better than we've we, we um, predict we stay conservative. So it could be a little better picture than that. I'm not, we're not positive on that. And so it's still a variable, though, because we don't know student count. And so, um, Bob, help me again with how many we estimated down. Uh, 7629, I think blended. that was six so years 7629 of the blended count, which is how your aid's done. Um, I, I think we'll beat that. You know, we do tend to be conservative, so some of that money can come back once we know our student count. Student count day is October. We really don't know it very well until November-ish, lately November, so that'll work in the stu student count number. Um, budgets financially 
conservative, fiscally responsible, you know, put all the words you want, slow, steady growth. Um, I, I think that's the right way to go. We're not spending tons of new money. We are in increasing expenditures, so as well. And I'll, I'll list just a few I think that are vital because it ties very well into Brian having the district improvement plan being approved tonight and school improvement plan because, you know, the biggest goal on there is closing the achievement gap. We're a high scoring district, but we have a group of kids that we're, we, we haven't met their needs as well as we'd like, and we need to close that achievement gap for all kids to give them that opportunity. And I think Gary's going to talk to you about some mon money that might help us do that as well tonight. But since then, you know, we, we've, um, we've added several things. You heard about the Paths Academy. I sent you that in a Friday letter, uh, 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 you know, a piece of evidence that maybe this thing might go. And that, that's a new piece. We've had instructional coaches at Midland High, North, East and Central Park will be getting one now as well. Woodcrest, we've uh, approved uh, financially a, a new reading intervention program over there, um, having some pull out and some resources there. Northeast, we've had math labs, we've had math staffing for him to uh, get his scores moving where he needs to with those at risk kids. Um, we create that administrative mentee program. Um, Siebert's sitting there with 607 kids, needs some more administrative support, obviously. Um, and so we're going to try to find a creative way of doing that without paying the full price for that and introducing and growing talent for our, ourselves as we go forward. Um, we've had a staffing throughout the district. We've supported a new program called um, Middle High School Chemic Challenge, an algebra math program during the summer for some of the at-risk kids. So that's just a sample of a few things I thought of off the top of my head today that are included in this new budget going forward. So a good budget, head in the right direction. We are beginning to grow the resources and the interventions we're putting in for the, the principals, but slowly and cautiously as we go forward. So, looking for approval. All right, excellent. At this time, I'll take a motion for approval of the 2017-18 general operating budget. I think that requires a roll call. We're not there yet. 3.2? I know, right now we're just doing a motion. Okay. <laughs> I move to approve. All right. Item 3.2, approval of 17-18 general operating budget. Support. All right, moved by Patrick, <coughs> support by Scott. Uh, looking at the district school improvement plan <coughs> process, it's great to see all the uh, improvements that are being put into the schools and uh, and just uh, creative ways of solving problems uh, like that ad administrative mentee program. I think that, that was a great move, or is a great move, and um, it will be. Um, I think this will will be a, a very wise way to spend funds. Um, I know that the budget also includes the, those teachers this summer working on Project Lead the Way and getting everybody up to speed with that with a bunch of different <coughs> projects that came through. Um, so teachers don't just have the summer off. They, a lot of them are working, uh, working hard to get ready for the upcoming school year and money has been allotted for that. Any other comments? All right, thank you all for your hard work on this. And thank you, Lansing. <laughs> So, all right, at this time, we need to do a roll call vote. So, I'll ask Scott. Okay, President Branstead. Yes. Vice President Singer. Yes. I vote yes. Treasurer Frizee. Yes. Member Baker. Yes. Member Blazy. Yes. Member Friedel. Yes. Okay, 7-0. All right, moving into 3.3, which is our secure entry furniture. <coughs> Of our yeah, we were given um, pretty much the background that I would say to you. I saw in the, in the minutes here for you, or in the agenda for you. Um, but a, as we're doing the secure entries, uh, five of the buildings uh, need some furniture because of the complete redesign. Woodcrest does not. The office is barely touched, so the others do. Um, we're going to use that consortium again. You know, it's the best bid price. We probably will do some bidding differently as we go forward, but because of time restraints, it would have been pretty difficult to do and get it here in time as well. And so that consor statewide consortium of pricing is where we're going to get the prices from again going forward. We gave you the detail of that, and so we're looking for approval to get that furniture in time for the start of the fall. All right. I will entertain a motion for approval of 3.3. So moved. All right. Support. Mary, support by Lynn. All right, at this time I'll open it up for discussion questions. I think you mentioned right there something at the end, but there's not going to be any issue. We're going to get this in time. There's yeah. not any lead yes. concerns. 
No, I don't think so. Not at all. We're, we're in good time on this one. Not according to the architect, they felt yeah. that if we passed it at this meeting, we would, we would be able to get it. Yeah, and they delivered pretty good, too. Um, uh, we're waiting on one set for Central Park, so I think, remember, we were a little worried on that. Mm -hmm. Most of it's already arrived, so yeah, they've been pretty good on the delivery. We, we were a little worried on that lead time. I just have one question about the Dow High setup, the yes. person that's seated out there. Yes. Is that one of the office professionals, or? I think he did choose, so we left it up to Steve, I think it was Left up the building, uh, I, I think somebody involved with student attendance, so I don't want to tell you. Because it makes sense the attendance person's out front with a check-in, check-out. Some of them staffed that with office professionals, some Just of the care professionals. Just a rearrangement of staff that's there, yeah. not needing to hire somebody else. Right. He left it in, in the principal's prerogative to what But I'm almost positive with. he said office OP that does yeah. associate with tenants. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right. Moving into 3.4, which is our <coughs> workers' compensation insurance. So that's yeah. And Cynthia's here, so if I misstep, <coughs> Bob worked on this as well, Bob and Lori. Um, so for a little while, we've um, been a, a little uncomfortable maybe with our workman's comp. We were presently self-funded. Good saving money seems to be a good rate going forward. But notice that we have lacked some resources and some knowledge. You know, we have advisors, consultants for lots of things that you provide to us from attorneys to bond consultants to financial advisors. We can't be an expert in all things. And HR knows HR, but the, the specifics of uh, uh, some of the workman's comp. And then um, with the self the plan, we were doing a bulk of that work. And, and you know, as you know, we've gotten significantly smaller or less manpower in all areas. And so, you know, we've even had to do the W-2s when people have workman's comps. And, um, we have to d get our own um, screenings and checks, uh, trainings as well. On. So we felt we felt well, there's probably a better way to do it, and we thought maybe we could save some money if we competitively bid on premium. We were probably a little surprised that um, workman's comp was still the very lowest of of all plans, but not um, that big of a difference between the lowest premium plan, and the premium plan is uh, accident fund. Am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah except on a large workman's comp. They provide all these services. We clarified it. We had them come in and um, explain to us to make sure this one of the reasons we bid. We want these services. Explain exactly how those services are going to be delivered to us. And we and we got the explanation we were looking for. And so um, about $20,000 different um, in the two plans, the self-funded and the lowest premium plan. Um, the other piece is under our self-funded plan, for me, coming in from outside eyes, we could be um, at risk of up to a million dollars. Correct, I said that wrong. Individually. Individually up to a million dollars. Um, so we're sitting at potentially up to that, a uh, hit of that. And then combined of injuries, five. Five, five, million. five million. So you look at, is that risk worth $20,000 different? And, you know, I tend to believe one thing, and then, but we did take it to FFO. We explained to FFO. We laid all of the plans out there and kind of wanted to see what they thought. And it was, I think, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, it was you that was in the room that said $20,000, or Patrick, one of no, you. No, we had that conversation. Pat, yeah. It said, yeah, well, that seems like a no-brainer for the risk factor itself plus the services. So we are bringing you the lowest premium plan there. Um, of Bone and Bailey, who should brought that to So it's the lowest bit of the premiums. Um, 20,000, approximately 20,000 more than our self-funded plan at this point. What our self-funded plan did over the trend over the last five years, self-funded obviously <laughs> depends on the year. Right. So looking for approval of that as well. All right, so at this time I will entertain a motion to approve item 3.4. So moved. All right. Support. All right, moved by Pam, or moved by Scott, supported by Pam. At this time I'll open it up for discussion. So, I mean, I'll comment that one of the things that I liked about moving to this plan was the additional services that they would <laughs> provide. So that to me was, that alone to me was worth going this way. Yep. Right. We have slimmed down so much with our administrative resources. It, it seemed like the, the right direction to go as opposed to hiring someone new to, to help with those responsibilities. So, and I could see that coming down the road if we didn't make a move like this. 
Yeah, I think it wasn't that people don't necessarily even have the time. I don't know if we even have that skill set for some of these things. Mm -hmm. Nor should we have expected that we would have had the skill set. So. It's <laughs> worth noting, too, that there, there, I believe there was a refund there. If we have multiple good years with low claims like we had before when we were self-funded, there is a rebate here available to us to get some of that back if things go in the yeah. right direction. Yeah, and so that difference may not be there, but we didn't really want to count the refund in ahead. But most years you do get a refund. <coughs> Yeah, two years before we're eligible yeah. for it. So. Yep. All right. Any other? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Moving into 3.5, which is board poli policy replacement of 5630.01, student seclusion and restraint. So Neola, uh, a new law passed. Gary probably <laughs> voted on it. So. Um, new legislation passed on seclusion of restraint in the state um, passed in December, January. We have to have a policy in place and act it by before fall uh, starts. And so Neola, uh, we had our spring update and then a couple weeks later they finally had their seclusion of restraint policy. So it straggled behind a couple weeks. So I did not take it to the Administrative Services Committee. It seemed pretty cut and dry. We have to do it. It's a you know replacement uh, to meet in the law. Um, lots of staff are being trained on it. There are some changes, but for the most part, it's a uh, common sense th of how we would seclude and restrain kids anyway. Um, but uh, we will be training um, all the way from bus drivers to administrators here in August. So they'll have training as well before. So approval, looking for approval of a new policy. All right, at this time I'll entertain a motion for approval of 3.5. So moved. All right. Support. All right, moved by Mary. Supported by Brad. At this time, I'll open it up for discussion <coughs> questions. Who's who does the training then? Yeah, um, a variety of uh, trainers come in. Um, I think our ESA is engaging with an, a, a law firm that um, is in, specializes in special education because this, it could be anyone in your seclusion restraint, but certainly special needs children often are, and that's where it kind of came from. Um, we do use um, ISDs. Claire Gladwin to our own ESA to train them. Um, Brian may know specifics better than I, but I think I covered it. Yeah, the them. only additionals that I'd add on to it is um, related to this often is CPI training, which is actual training on the restraint holding. And we've moved to have two of our own internal employees be trainers to help us with fiscal efficiencies awesome. on that. So we recently had um, some from Human Resources and Special Education trained as trainers. And we've built into the budget for next year um, resources to be able to do that. So. We will be able to train our people in a much more fiscally efficient manner so than we've be had a, to before. So a number of people in each building that will be? Correct. It, uh, amongst the seclusion and restraint laws that need to have a crisis team yeah. and members of that team need to be trained. In addition, all of our building administrators, um, CPI training has to have an annual renewal to it <laughs> as well. So again, we're in a much better position to meet the pillars of this law going forward. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, we will now move into our addition 3.6, <coughs> which is the uh, following person recommended for employment, which is Janet Greif. So I think I'll turn it over to you. Mike. Yep. So, um, you know, I had to look back a little bit, but start discussing with you midwinter about filling the, um, and make sure I understand, this is the, the position we're actually filling was the assistant superintendent, but I'm going to fill it as an associate superintendent, which saves you some dollars as well. Um, but when we chose to um, not fill that position a couple of years ago, um, we really thought we'd do it for six months to a year. Um, we, we've done it for two. Um, the job duties have been a little bit burdensome, and I'm going to say it's been more for Rob and Brian than I. Um, but they certainly have picked up all those duties, and our directors have certainly has fallen on the directors, which I think kind of got me into a new model. And so in front of you, we've got a model of a transition plan where we're going to uh, move back up to three agenda group members along with me, but get back to two. But that does mean that we're growing and elevating our director's um, responsibilities along there as well. We've kind of, over time, tried to work a little bit on the compensation there for those as they grow some responsibility as well um, going forward. But I think there'll be a more efficient model that now fits Midland Public at our 7,500 student range and a little smaller district of, than we were going forward. 
Um, therefore, you'll stay with that, uh, um, go back to the two configuration with the superintendent, but director's playing a higher, more elevated role as we go. So transition chart over three years, I don't know that it's set in stone. Uh, I think, you know, Brian and Bob took a shot at it. I was uncomfortable with a few things, tweaked them around, but still not sure we got the exact breakout of duties perfect, or maybe that's where it starts, but it'll end up slightly different going forward. I think the transition is vital as well because, you know, um, when Linda Klein announced her retirement a few years back, and we all knew she was going to, from the moment you hired me, she, she made it clear she was only going to be here for a while and um, for a year. And uh, we were trying to figure out how to, to do that because, you know, as we were telling Brad earlier, you don't get off to a kindergarten teacher with an MBA right. who understands the educational side of it and the financial side of it. And um, so I, I kept, for the first two or three months, I said, Linda, I can talk you out of retirement. She said, no, you can't. <laughs> and then finally I said, Linda, so where are we going? How, how, who, do, who do we replace in this position? And um, she mentioned Bob. And if you know Bob's uh, quick on the uptake with the numbers and, and has good thought and he's provided a ton of that for us. So going forward, I think it's vital that we transition or we may lose that piece as well. Now, Lori's knowledge of uh, being a business director at ISDs in local districts for I think almost 20 years now is vital and she's been great but we still want that educational oversight of how we do our budget and so that's part of that as well going forward um, and then it gives Brian also who does the CIA so well to begin to teach and elevate that uh, person behind him as well in that area so so Jen's here tonight she wasn't able to be here uh, two weeks ago because she, she ran her last uh, <coughs> uh, board meeting for a while anyway and um, and Jen's background I think you guys all know but I'd, I'd love to mention it to you. So she, you know, she's been a sound educator f since she was in here. She's worked in multiple districts. She's been an elementary principal in our district, and um, as well as another one, middle school principal here, high school principal here. And now with that superintendent background, I kind of think she was an ideal candidate. And so I, I think I texted her one day and said, "Hey, can I buy you lunch?" I think it was McDonald's and a Coke. But <laughs> she didn't get a whole lot out of me yeah, when I was buying. Lot, <laughs> <laughs> I think you did actually. <laughs> So, uh, um, but we began a discussion then, and um, over time it's evolved, and over, the, I think, the last month or so, she finally answered me, and so, Jen's here. I am looking for a motion for approval. All right. Time. I am entertaining a motion for item 3.6, which is, um, I motion to approve Janet, uh, item 3.6. Support. Moved by Pam, supported by Lynn. Is there any discussion at this point in time? Well, Janet, we, I personally cannot be happier <laughs> to have you come join uh, MPS again. Um, I've had uh, the, the pleasure of um, seeing Janet in action from Plymouth Elementary to Northeast, Midland High, and what a class act. Uh, I feel very fortunate and lucky that Midland Public Schools gets you back again. So I'm looking forward to working with you, and I'm looking forward to your leadership. And I'd like to say I'm very happy to be coming back. I'd like to thank you know, Mike and the board for allowing me this opportunity. I spent 11 great years, but I love this Midland, and look forward to serving the staff and students again going forward. So I'm very happy to come back and start on July. Is there any more comments or discussion on this? Just same thing. I'd like to welcome Janet back. She's just, you're a gem, and we're, <coughs> we're very excited. I paid both of them. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't paid off <laughs> no I, I too I had um, the opportunity to work with Janet as a teacher um, under her leadership and uh, I know we went to a conference together to look at some uh, changes in, in middle and public schools at that time and um, as a teacher you look at the administration here and you have a different viewpoint it, it uh, you, you wonder what they're doing. <laughs> you, know, you wonder what they're doing, because you know as a teacher and as administrators in the building, they're working their tails off. And, you, and you, I didn't get a, an idea of how much work the administration does until I got this position on the school board and realizing the amount of time and hours that they put in and how spread they get thin, or how thinly they get spread. And I think um, Janet's an important addition. Well, we know her expertise and um, coming in running because she already has um, knowledge of Midland Public Schools. I think that's an important asset and we can't let it go. 
I guess the other thing I would add too is when when we did uh, go down in numbers so much with the administrators, um, number one, what a great move to get us back to a balanced budget and how necessary that was. But again, a big thank you for the people who had to take on that extra workload. Um, one concern I've had for the last couple of years is, boy, <coughs> if something happened to one of these people over here, we were in a heap of trouble. So um, I, I've talked to Mike a few times about, are we OK? Can we, can we, have, um, can we add another administrator back? And I think this was a, a necessary move for our district. So thank you for getting that done as well. Yes. All right, any other discussion? I just wanted to make a comment. Mike covered all the historical of that very well. Um, I have uh, been getting some information, uh, historical information, which, which was great. But I had asked also that if we could have the agenda group administrative realignment. It's a working document. It's a work in progress. But it gives a roadmap for our next three years. And I asked that just to be integrated into our meeting minutes so that the public could see what our plan is. It's not something that we are voting on, but it's a plan, and I think it shows the needs analysis. It shows what the roles are of our administration. They could change as early as July 2nd. But it, it gives a roadmap of Mike talking to people, working with Brian and Bob, and creating the needs analysis, and then the roadmap for that moving forward. And Pam, I just had one correction for you. It's an unfilled position, not adding one back in, which Thank I you. was Thank you. Discussion <laughs> and so that's thanks, Brad. So that is my only comment, and I just wanted to have that be a part of our minute. So we have a shows the road. Thank you. So yes, and I'll say welcome back, Janet. And people have commented already because some people were very upset when you laughed like it was my you know responsibility. That I, you. <laughs> so I was on the board. So I'm glad that you're back. <laughs> people have. So all right. Any other discussion? All right, at this time, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, welcome back to Midland Public Schools, Janet. Thank you. All right, at this time, we'll move into item four, which is request to address the board. And tonight, we have Gary Glenn with us. Is that on? Yeah, I think you're good. Right. That's good. Right. Madam President, I appreciate this opportunity. You don't get the opportunity uh, all the time to be able to make the kind of announcement uh, and share with you tonight something that we've been able to get done for Midland Public Schools. I would note in reference to the state budget overall that it was provided you and it was good to see your process tonight since you're working on your budget. The fact that we provided you a state budget in June and not October 1, as is provided by the Constitution. I think it's now seven years in a row that we have done that. <clears throat> so good to see it in practice as to what the value of that is. Uh, I commend you. This is the first time I've seen some of you since the last election, so congratulations on your election. Thank you for the job of, that you do of, uh, of administering what is, I think, a significant element in the quality of life for which Midland is known. And uh, I was very excited to get to tour the new school, the new STEM school, which is going to put Midland even more, or again, on the national map. Uh, the only kind of school, as I understand, of its kind in the nation, the first. And it'll be a model to a lot of others. Uh, the state budget this year expends $14.7 billion on K-12 through education. That's the most in the history of the state of Michigan. And at the same time, we have 15,000 fewer state employees than we did in 2001. Uh, except for our paying down debts to the tune of $1.6 billion, we would actually be spending less in this state budget. In state government budgeting, it's the only time when you pay down debt that's counted as an expenditure. But except for our paying down debt, $1.6 billion, we would actually be spending less than we did in last year's budget. And yet we are spending more than we ever have in the state's history on K-12 education. So it is a more conservative budget. I make no apologies for that. But the prioritization of K through 12 education is evident. If the overall budget is being tightened, uh, clearly in terms of state employees and, and other ways of measuring it, and we're at a record high spending for K through 12, it's obvious that the priority that the state legislature puts 
on K through 12 education. Um, I can announce tonight something that happens every year. Midland Public Schools is going to get an additional $60 per pupil, an increase in the amount of funding that you get from the state education budget. And yes, Superintendent, I understand that no matter how much it is, it's never enough. <laughs> but nonetheless, and, and it is, uh, there still remains a disparity because remember, most of the school districts in the state and their state representatives are not in the same situation Midlands, Midland is. And so there is a two to one funding formula. Midland will get $60 more per pupil, but the less well-off districts are getting $120 more per pupil. So we still have that disparity, still trying to grow us to the point at some point in the future where it'll be the same amount from the state of Michigan for every student in Michigan, regardless of where they happen to go to school because all students are of equal value. And as a matter of principle, the state ought to appropriate the same amount of money for everybody, uh, but we're not there yet. What I'm very happy to announce tonight, and of course we sat here and did it the other day for the news media, but to announce tonight is some brand new first time ever money amounting to $233 per pupil for Midland, a total of $524,955 first ever appropriation specifically earmarked to help at-risk children and uh, if you read the newspaper article you know what the story is but I think it's a story worth telling two years ago in April of 2015 when I was on the job for about the third month was still learning the issues I met with Superintendent Shero, former board president Jerry Wasserman and Representative Tim Kelly who at the time was chairman of the K through 12 appropriation subcommittee in the current legislature, he's chairman of the Education Committee and the K through 12 uh, uh, Appropriations Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. And we met back down the hall here, the four of us. I had never heard of at-risk funding or 31A funding as it's referenced. So the genesis of the principle as discussed by Superintendent Shero and former President Wasserman was simply that instead of allocating that at-risk money to school districts, based on their test performance and statistics as to what percentage of the students are or are not considered at risk either by the state or by the federal government. That if there's at risk money, it should follow the child because we have at risk students, not at risk districts. And uh, that sounded to me like a compelling principle. Now I've been involved in the legislative process now for almost 40 years and knowing that there are only about 50 school districts in the state that are like ours here in Midland. Uh, and legislators who represent the vast majority, in fact, 90% of the school districts are in a different category than we are. It was a steep hill to climb because as long as spending remains static, if Midland ever got any of this money, that meant somebody else got less. So it was an uphill climb. And I think I said at the time, guys, we ought to try to establish the principle and if we make progress 10 years from now, we wouldn't have gotten it done if we didn't start today to try and establish the principle. So to achieve what we've achieved in now only two years time and not 10, I, I think is very gratifying and, and pretty remarkable. The first year after we had that uh, meeting in April with the budget about to be approved, so very late in the budget process, and I'm not sure about how your budget process works, but the later you get in it, the harder it is to change it. But even as a first term legislator, uh, with the assistance of Tim Kelly, the first year we got it put into that budget, so that would have been for the 2015-2016 budget, that if there were any extra money in the budget, that we would distribute some of it to school districts like Midland for at-risk children. But there was no extra money in the budget, so it was just a statement of principle. And even that did not survive negotiations with the Senate. They took it out. So that's how far we got. We got the House's approval the first year. In the second year, and I believe the amount was $8 million, there actually was $8 million of new money appropriated specifically to go to school districts like Midland to provide funding for the assistance of at-risk children. And then we had a revenue projection shortfall in the, the spring of uh, 2016. And that's one of the things that ended up on the cutting room floor when we had to go back and cut like $350 million out of the current year or the coming year's budget uh, at the last minute. And so it didn't make it uh, through on the second year either. 
But as I heard Superintendent Shero say the other day when I met with him, uh, how surprised we were that in the governor's state of the state address for the first time, he put it in. So I, I just, I, I just, I mean, from my experience in in, in Lansing uh, and knowing who said what and when they said it and and what, uh, I believe this only happened because of that meeting that we had here with Superintendent Shero and, and uh, former President Wasserman and Representative Kelly and myself and, and being in positions. Representative Kelly, the Chairman of Education, Chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee, myself, Associate Speaker of the House, uh, that somebody started paying attention. The governor proposed a, a figure in the budget that was larger than what we actually ended up with, but we know that's always going to be the case. I was telling Mike, yeah, but you know, don't, don't be counting the chickens before they're hatched. But going back and forth in the process, the budget we finally approved is over half a million dollars for Midland. And I went back and looked since 1995 when this at-risk funding started, Midland, High, Midland Public Schools has never received a dime of this money, even though 28% of our student population in Midland Public Schools falls under the state or federal definition of at-risk. Um, I noted, uh, Superintendent, uh, that there is a stipulation that up to 5% of that money can be used for personnel, training, staff, but the other 95% of it is earmarked specifically to help those at-risk children. So it's not just to go into the general budget uh, or be used for administration. The uh, additional $60 per pupil for all students, that happens every year, plus the uh, new at-risk money for Midland Public Schools means that Midland Public Schools this budget year will receive over $1 million more from the state than it did the, the year before. And that does not count the amount of money that the state appropriates and has for the last several years to pay down the MIPSER's debt, your share of it. Uh, if you had, to, if we did not take responsibility for that payment, that would be money that would have to come out of your operating budget. So there's an additional amount uh, beyond that. And right now, it would be about one third of all the state money that's appropriated for the Midland Public School System uh, that goes to pay off that MIPSER's debt. And the only reason it's only a third is because the retirement system anticipates 8% return on investment, which is far more ambitious than what the market is actually returning. It's more like 6.5%. And if it was adjusted down to what the market is actually producing, it would rise to over 50% of the, the, the funding that the state provides for middle and public schools. Uh, you're also aware it's been in the news, and I'll brief you here just uh, uh, on a few points about the teacher's pension fund reform that we believe the governor is going to sign into law here in the next several weeks. Uh, some principles to keep in mind. According to our state constitution, the legislature cannot touch the pension obligation for those who are already in the pension system who are already retired. And that's a position that's been taken in court by Attorney General Bill Schuette. So the legislature cannot mess with any teachers any who's te currently on the pension plan affect their pension. Uh, however, it is $30 billion in the hole. And if we did not address it, we think uh, that would be irresponsible because someday that could lead to the point where the state and local governments are incapable of paying for everything we've committed to. And if you're in a position where you have a financial challenge, it's usually a good idea to stop digging the hole even deeper. So that's what we did. Uh, and we set up a new 401k system for new teachers. You know, 50% of public school teachers, at least statewide, do not stay in the classroom long enough, 10 years, to vet, to get vested so that they ever get anything from the money that you would spend toward their pensions. They teach in the public schools for nine years and then leave. None of that money goes with them. But under the 401k system, whatever money is put into that system by the teacher or by you as their employer is portable. It's their private property. It goes with them. We think that's better for most incoming teachers, should make it, make it more attractive uh, to go into the education system as a profession. Uh, and also a, a dramatic improvement in what the match will be, because under the current 401k hybrid system, if a teacher were to commit 6% of his or her income to that 401k under the old system, they'd get a 3% match from their employer, you plus the state. But under this new system, if they make a 3% commitment of their own money 
then they uh, receive a, a match of 7% from you as the employer in the state. So it, it is a more lucrative uh, 401k offering for new public school teachers and one which is their personal property to take with them as they uh, move on to something else if in fact they do move on. In addition to all the other funding that I've already talked about, the state is also appropriating in this budget $200 million more toward the pay down of that $30 billion unfunded liability. Over the course of the next 20 years, we calculate that's worth one, about $1.2 billion. That's, we've still got a long way to go. It's going to be decades before that $30 billion is paid off completely. But when we reach that point, and I believe it's 2048, so some time yet to go, but when we reach that point, if we continue to follow the plan that we've outlined, there will be no more unfunded liability, and all of that money will be freed up to be expended into the classroom. Uh, so there's going to be a payoff, perhaps, for our grandchildren in addition to all of, all of this. Uh, we did not think it was a healthy situation to look at the teacher pension system as what would be in the private sector a Ponzi scheme where the ability to pay out is dependent on those who are currently paying in. In the private sector, it's called a Ponzi scheme. You go to prison, like Bernie Madoff. Uh, and so we didn't think it was responsible to continue to, uh, to operate a system that was somehow dependent on getting the new teachers to pay into a pension from which, if they ever left the profession before 10 years, they don't get a penny of benefit. Um, but under the Constitution, as I said in the beginning, we cannot diminish the pension obligation to anybody who's already earned it. And so the state, uh, we, we, we just felt it was the fiscally responsible thing to do to avoid the position that the state of Illinois, if you've seen the headlines in the last several days, the state of Illinois on the point of actually being in default, going bankrupt, the first state ever. And so we think we have a, uh, responsibly addressed that. So all of that you know, landscape just to have the, uh, the uh, exciting opportunity to be able to announce to you that your superintendent and a former board president gave me a bone to chew on. And I kept <clears throat> chewing, and something happened, and I'm very uh, gratified that that was to be the case. So I, I guess I would say, give me another bone. <laughs> and uh, I understand, no matter how much it is, it's never enough. Uh, but, of course, we're talking about educating our children. And my, uh, my oldest son, who graduated from Midland High, now has four children, not any one of them yet school age. Four came along pretty quickly. But uh, we think this plan will benefit future generations, this MIPSERS reform plan. And I'm excited. You know, I had to leave it to Superintendent Chair to characterize how big a deal is half a million dollars. And by the way, that's not a one-time appropriation. We've established the principle. Even yet, Midland Public Schools and the other 50-some schools that are in the same situation financially as ours is, we're only receiving in that at-risk funding a third of what the other at-risk funded schools are receiving. So we're still not at a point where we're receiving, uh, where it's being appropriated on an equal dollar amount per student. Even at the last minute, the 90% of legislators who represent districts who are not in the position ours are, we're pushing back against the size of the appropriation for Midland Public Schools and others, and they actually got it reduced a little bit more even uh, than it was when the House first approved. But half a million dollars sounded like quite a bit to me. Uh, you know better than I whether that's a small thing or a big thing. It sounded like a pretty big thing to me. I hope that we find in practice that it's not just uh, you know mathematically a pretty big number but that it'll actually have the impact we all hope it'll have to help the children who are in that category. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to do my best to answer them, but I just uh, didn't want to miss this opportunity to come share it with you personally of a success that we had. I, my job as a legislator, I see, is to approach broad principles that affect the entire state, but it's also part of my job to, dare I say, bring home the bacon. <laughs> um, and I, I don't mean to mean that be that crass about it, but I also have an obligation to represent, uh, you know, the Midland Public School District along with Bullet Creek and Pinconning and Bay City Western and and uh, Meridian, all of whom have always received this at-risk funding. And I believe every single one of them got the $120 per pupil increase. Uh, so, anyway, this is what's new, and I'm excited to report it to you. And and I appreciate. Uh, 
Superintendent Shero and former Board President Wasserman sending me in that direction, and happy to report we got her done. So thank you, right. Madam thank Chair. You. Thank, so thank, much you. thank you so much for taking thank the you. time to come out tonight and talk with us, and thank you for all the hard work that you've done. I know a few years ago, yeah, there was some quick calculator on MLive, and I mean, knowing what we have as far as at-risk students, I went to see how much we got, and it said zero. And I was surprised, and I, I think that goes along with people have, a lot of people outside of Midland have a different perception of Midland than what's reality right now. And that is we do have a lot of students who are at risk. And well, I don't know how long uh, Jerry Wasserman served on the board, but he said in his first year on the board he thought the figure was 10%. And now it's, they tell me it's 28, mm -hmm. so nearly tripled. And yes, the community's changing, the state's changing, the country's changing, the world's changing. But uh, we have now established, somebody asked the other day, well, what's, what next? If, it's never, if whatever we get is never enough, what's the next principle to pursue? And eventually it is that the state and its appropriating role, its expending for education, will allocate the same amount of money for every student, no matter where they are, no matter where they go to school, no matter what community, and that includes the at-risk money. So we're still not there yet. But now you're in the position where having been once appropriated, now you've got those legislators representing the 50 school districts from whom you'd be taking something away. You know, that hurdle we had to overcome, the perception that we would be taking away from somebody else to be able to, to get uh, funding for students in our district. Uh, now, having been established, I think it's going to be a continual appropriation in the future. I will be in the House at least another, well, Lord Willing and the voters of Midland Bay Counties at least another three years. Uh, so I'll certainly be there to do my best to ensure that it remains perpetual, but I think we've established the principle and it will be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving into item five, which is FFO. So we had a um, study committee meeting on June 16th. So, Patrick, yep. if you would. Yep, we, <coughs> we had two main topics. Thank you. Um, we discussed both, the, both of those already tonight, but we'll run through them. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little more detail. Uh, the first was workers' compensation insurance. The district has been exploring the cost and benefits of being self-insured for workers' comp insurance versus a premium-based workers' comp insurance plan. Through the bidding process, quotes were received for a premium-based plan. The FFO committee discussed the district's current self-insured workers' comp insurance, five-year history of claims and costs, and the bids received. Based on the cost of the plan versus our five-year self-insured costs, the reduced exposure to upper, level, upper levels of liabilities, and the support provided in the areas of district safety and loss prevention, the FFO committee is recommending the change to premium-based workers' comp insurance plan through low bidder, Bone and Bailey, which we discussed here just a few moments ago. Our number two was secure entry furniture. Uh, Mr. Cooper shared information regarding the purchase of furniture in some of the buildings where the installation of the secured entry caused significant changes in the building's main office. This purchase will be brought to the tonight's meeting for approval. Detailed plans and invoices were provided and discussed. Purchase will follow previous furniture purchases using national contract pricing. All purchases fall within the furniture budget for that building. Our next meeting is Monday, July 10th at 5 o'clock. Yeah, I have two items. I can't believe I'm going to say for only for $5,810, huh. uh, but both very nice. In fact, I looked just a minute ago to, to know that I, you know, we're coming to the end of uh, what we consider gifting, and, and I looked real quick at the total, just shy, just over, excuse me, $412,000 that I've been reading to you over the last year. So uh, I don't want to say only to anything here. It's pretty impressive. Um, $1,500 for choir supplies from the high music boosters and 4300 basically for ice machine and magazine subscriptions for or from the Chestnut Hill PTO. All right, thank you. Moving into item six, human resources. Um, there wasn't a meeting between our last one and this, so. There was a retirement, and Elizabeth Daniels, elementary teacher at Sea Red Elementary, has announced her retirement effective June 16, 2017. All her years of service to our district. All right, item seven is correspondence to and from the Board of Education. You can read that in here. 
<coughs> um, eight is scheduled activities. Our next board meeting will be Monday, July 17, 2017. And at this time, moving into item nine, study discussion session. And Mary, I'll start with you tonight. Just um, <coughs> trying trying times for a lot of a lot of families here in Midland um, with the flooding and. Uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to you. Um, it um, just seeing things piled up at the at this curb is is difficult. I have have lived through that kind of flooding, and I know it's de devastating when you lose things that are important to you, memories, and and uh, so my thoughts and prayers to you. And a good meeting. Great. I just wanted to say that that's wonderful that we're able to address that money for our 28 uh, percent very important um, just happy that Gary could come here and present that to us that's wonderful information um, I had made a request last meeting that we had time for the board packet and we don't have to discuss that now but we I appreciate you looking into that and I'm sure that maybe in a future meeting we can discuss that a little bit more and then I had one other thing that I had presented to you in kind of an email, and this is, does not have to be discussed today, but maybe on an ongoing basis, as an example, when we've had these wonderful presentations of, of the young kids when they come in, like today's example, they would have had to have been sitting there for 45 minutes. And in certain situations, I wonder if when we have these wonderful presentations, if it's a big group or, or, or younger children or something like that, that maybe we move it even ahead of the consent agenda in some of those special circumstances. But that's just up for discussion. Okay, because I think it's usually right after the consent agenda. In case so the consent agenda went longer. Five minutes in. Right. So. The, uh, on the board, <coughs> board packet, Brad, um, you got it on Wednesday? Yeah, that was wonderful. So we, we went back and we um, did study and take a look at how and what we could do. Um, so we we do a pre-agenda meeting, and so um, how we develop the agenda involves all the directors to the, the uh, associate superintendents and I, and we have a meeting, and traditionally it's been Tuesday morning for years here, and so we moved it to Mondays, and we were able to get out on Wednesdays. We think Wednesday's doable. I think when you do four business days, Tuesday's not. Okay. So our goal is Wednesday going forward, and so um, hopefully we hit that. You know, there could be some weird... Structurally changed. Mm -hmm. Two things I want to lay on it is there could be that crazy last minute exception or something, but we could always send out like a, um, at that point even a draft and knowing that something's going to be coming still and we'll notify you at it. Cindy did have one small change and so we gave the email notification, which I think probably would have helped uh, on the other one. And so we, we have adjusted and I think we've just go forward and see how that works. I think we've got it kind of solved the, the best we think we can do at this point. I, d I just appreciated Gary Glenn coming tonight too, and I'm just so excited about the the funding because um, when he commented about years ago with Jerry, it was about that percent of at risk and uh, people, as, as you commented, people are amazed when you tell them what the percentages are here in Midland and, and that our socioeconomic structure has changed. So it's an exciting start, and I thank you, Mike and and Jerry and all those people that are involved and you know I'm always urging you guys to contact <coughs> your legislators there's times we feel like right I know I do yeah. the same and go oh god it's you know I'm wasting my time but you know same there way. are our labors do eventually get heard sometimes at mm -hmm. least uh, by reasonable people and you know I'll give credit Gary credit on this I don't think we always agree eye to eye it's he, t he knows because he the one thing he's very good is responding to me and he knows I've sent some strong ones at him but um, he came in that meeting and he did listen to us and he did take it back and um, you know, I, I think it was really Brian and I, they used to always say, coming here from a district that got at-risk funds, boy, it's just not right. We still have at-risk kids. And then I give Jerry credit because Jerry listened to me, and, and Jerry was the one who pushed so hard in that meeting that said this is ridiculous. And, you know, Jerry's vernacular does a pretty good job of saying that over and over. And so I, it, did, it did go forward. We're in, we're in the funds, which is tremendous. Now i got to work Gary from 33% to to at least you know 50 <laughs> or 60 percent so I'm not done working on that so <laughs> it's gonna be exciting how how what we see as we go forward and being able to help our yeah. our students and, sure, and right at those and, kids absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know they, they deserve that and then once again welcome to Janet you know she'll be getting her feet wet real quick and uh, 
And also, I just as we talked about the furniture with the schools and in the, my last visit to Central Elementary, we went, ran over when the kiddos were going through, and it was really fun to see the excitement that they had as they go through that building. And um, now, as we start putting the furniture in, and you know, we all kind of visualize it. But I'm looking forward to seeing, and in the other schools as well, as we move forward. And fall will be exciting. So that's it. All right, Scott. It was a great meeting tonight. Um, you know, we see firsthand persistence pays off uh, with, with the finances. Um, thank you, Mike and Jerry, if he's out there listening, and, and uh, Gary Glenn for taking care of that. Um, $525,000 is certainly nothing to sneeze at, and I think he kind of minimized it a little bit, but it's going to have a huge impact for our students and our ability to educate uh, those students in need. Um, welcome home. It's great to have you back. Uh, it just I guess a nod to the, the note you made about uh, the flooding. It is a kind of a critical time in our community and, and one of the great hallmarks that I see driving around town is neighbors helping neighbors and everybody kind of pitching in and no real water issues out where I live but uh, one of my neighbors went out on social media and said, hey, I've got a big pickup truck and a trailer. What can I do to help anybody? You know, just let me know, I'll come and do it. And, that was all over the place. Everybody was helping everybody, and just another great reason um, to live here and be part of this community. So just wanted to thank everybody who, who participated in that and an ongoing effort. That's all. Thank you. Very good. Um, well, I had a lot of the same that was hit already, so I'll skip that. But um, our last meeting, I mentioned uh, I thought it would be important that our board has representation at ESA meetings, and I had gone to the last ESA meeting and I think Mary and Brad are interested in sharing that responsibility too and I saw uh, representation from Coleman and Meridian there as well so um, I think that it'll, it'll be a, a good place for us to be to understand um, what their priorities are what they're working on and um, come back and, and report so I'll have to put some meeting minutes together and uh, work that out as well. I have um, family in town this week, and a sister-in-law is a teacher in Colorado, and, and I called Mike and I asked him if I could give, give them a tour of Central Park Elementary. And I've never seen such teacher envy. <laughs> so yes. I think she took 45 pictures and put them on her Facebook page, and she probably had 38 comments within the first 10 minutes. So um, it was uh, it was very neat to see her perspective as an elementary school uh, teacher coming in and uh, and seeing what we're doing here. So I, I think I'm close to getting her to move back to Michigan. <laughs> um, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if much else new that anybody else hasn't said, but it is important to say thank you to Mr. Glenn, and hopefully Jerry realizes that is was it 14 or 15 years on the board that it still pays dividends and his work hard work still has still paid off so hopefully somebody lets him know if he doesn't watch this that it's still appreciated and he knows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Janet welcome back I know we have a lot of either new or young principals in a lot of places in the district it'd be good to have I'm not saying what we don't have right now isn't working well but to have that additional help certainly will be a good thing for us as we move forward here so um, other than that I it's been said Thanks to Gary Glenn and Mike and Jerry and Tim Kelly and everybody who's yeah, put in a lot of hard work to get funding across the board for all the children in Michigan who qualify for that type of funding. So um, that is all I have. Yep, so I'm going to invite you on a construction tour. I don't know if we get to all these sites on that day, and, and I had to start a little early. I know some of you, you know, with work and stuff, but hopefully, even if you have, arrive a little late, you can catch us on a text. Angela suggests that we take the donated uh, van from uh, the Midland High, and we could all ro rotate together. I don't know how many holds Bob do you, but we'll... we'll yeah, we'll do we'll do that as well. <laughs> and their clubs, I'm assuming. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and you know, you, you've seen Central Park, but it's really getting close. And so it'll be a, a good quick tour. You've seen it enough, but see those finishes. But I want to see you guys to begin to see um, what's going on with Woodcrest as well, because 
of that um, potential, uh, not just having a fresh newer building, but the changing of the destruction in there as well, what it may look like in the early stages. And the amount of work they've already done, incredible. I mean, the, before the teachers walked out on Friday, Thursday, Thursday, right guys? Thursday was the last day. But didn't they even start on Thursday? Yeah, they did. They had the heating systems and cooling systems off on Thursday night tor tear being torn out. So they really have gone gangbusters and they have to. I mean, I can't remember, it's 48 days when you look at it over a summer to redo what they want to do in the summer. It's not a whole lot of time. And so, but that'll be neat to see. And then you'll see some secure entrances as well. Um, Northeast might be the best one because it's also getting lockers in there. So maybe we'll, we'll make sure we hit that one first because I don't think we'll get to them all as we go. And then we'll run a quick FFO meeting after that. I also forward you the K-3 literacy plan. I think this is Brian's baby with a bunch of other uh, staff members who worked hard on this. Um, meeting that new legislation, it's something that uh, I'm excited about. I think Brian is too with the potential there of what we can get, again do for kids intervening early in the reading areas. Um, ironic, I share this all the time when we first started discussing with Brian. Um, superintendent I worked on under an Algonac, a very successful one, was an elementary principal who had a PhD in reading. So he took two or three years out of his life and went back to Michigan State and got a PhD in reading. I think he created this plan like in 1995 because we ran this very typical plan way back then. So he was way ahead of his times, which we often knew he was. But um, it was, so with Brian and I have had some experience with something similar to this as well. And then our community, it, it, you know, I, I wasn't here, obviously, I probably was. No, I just left the state in 86 when you had your flood um, at that time. But um, um, my daughter was hit. Um, living over by the Cook School around Wintergreen and walking, well you said earlier, um, so Cindy's son-in-law, I'm panicked, I see there's water in the basement, they don't know what to do and uh, Cindy's son-in-law comes, comes up with a pump, the pump works fantastic and drains the basement over a couple of days, we're out in the community, everyone's sharing resources and pumps and um, it's not just our community. As I walked their neighborhood, I met four or five of our staff members who lived just houses down who were all dealing with this. And I think for me, what really hit home was how many of them, because of this unusual flood and the way it occurred, has very minimal insurance coverage. And the damage is much more than their insurance will, will cover. So this, this will have some lasting effects. Most of them were talking about, you know, demoing their basements and leaving them for years as they began to put that back together. And so, um, yeah, it's going to have an effect on our kids and our, our, our community members for sure going forward. But it is a neat community. Everyone was out there helping everybody, you know. And the Cook property came in handy, but I saw about 500 cars parked over there because uh, you could get to Cook, but you couldn't get into the community. You had to walk in from there, so that was kind of neat as well. So thoughts and prayers with those residents. That's all I have. Thank you.